just record to the cloud. There we go. So, hi to my online students. Um, so, it's going to be a kind of short lesson today, I expect. We are going to introduce some fairly elementary definitions. Um, so, linear algebra, the word, comes from linear equations. And you've certainly, at some point, been told that a linear equation looks like this, y equals mx plus b. And then maybe at some point you've also been told you could rewrite y equals mx plus b, so that a linear equation is written like this. And it's called, I believe, the standard form is what it's called when this is introduced to students. And the thing about the standard form that sets it apart from the point intercept y equals equals mx plus b form, I guess that's the slope intercept, but what sets this second form apart is that it's very clear that if we wanted to, we could have an equation that looks basically like this second equation, but which has more variables in it. You know, when you have y equals mx plus b, you have the y and you have the x, and if you wanted to add a z, it's not at all clear how you do it, but... The general form makes it easy to add more variables. We can just do it like that. And this general form then motivates our definition. A linear equation. is an equation that looks like, that has the form, if we want to sound fancy, um, a variable, sorry, a constant times a variable, plus another constant times another variable, and we can just repeat this pattern however often we want. Equals some D, let's say. And um, you'll notice that on the previous frame, we had x, y, and z. Here we have x1, x2, x3. That's just because we don't know how many variables we have necessarily. Um, there are applications with more than 26 variables, so... It, it's just easiest to use the subscript. Yeah. So, for example, 5x1 minus 2x2 plus x3 plus x4 equals 10 is a linear equation. And then a solution 
to a linear equation is values of x's that make it true. And a solution is given as a list. So, for example, x1 equals 0, x2 equals 0, x3 equals 0, x4 equals 10. This is a solution to this equation. 5 times 0 minus 2 times 0 plus 0 plus 10 does indeed equal 10. And it's written like so. And what you might realize um, pretty quickly is that this linear equation that I have written on the board, in fact, has a bunch of solutions. Um, two, zero, zero, Zero is also a solution. Five times two minus two times zero plus zero plus zero also equals 10. And that leads us to define the solution set, which is a pretty self-explanatory name. It's the set of all the solutions. For an arbitrary linear equation, the solution set is going to be infinite. I mean, you can play dumb games and create equations that don't have any solutions. Like that, for example. But otherwise, there are always going to be an infinite number of solutions. And it might help for what's coming down the road to look at, let's call this an example. To look at the solution set of a linear equation with two variables. So something like 2x1 plus 3x2 equals 5. So the solution set is infinite. Um, we can think of solution sets graphically. 
here if we've got two variables. In theory, when we've got three variables, although in practice, graphing in three-dimensional space is awkward. Once we've got to four variables, we can't, but, but we're going to get some useful intuition. from thinking of a solution set as just a bunch of points on a plane. So what's this solution set going to look like? An increasing line. Yeah, an increasing, a decreasing line, I think, but a uh, line is the line is the word I was really aiming for. Yeah, when we take the other over, we'll get a negative slope. So not making any effort to draw that realistically or make sure the y-intercept is in the right place. But the solution set in this case is just a line. Um, in three-dimensional space, the solution set is a thing. If you have three, um, variables and you graph them and this room is the space, the solution set will be all the points on some two-dimensional plane in the room. And then after that, as I say, it's impossible to visualize. Um, if this were all we looked at, um, these linear equations, linear algebra would be a very short class. What happens in practice in a lot of situations is that we have multiple linear equations at the same time. What we call a system of linear equations. And have you, like in algebra or whatever, solved like systems of linear, yeah, using substitution or elimination or stuff like that? Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, they show up in situations where well, where we have multiple constraints on the same variable, like, I don't know. Um, there's, a, there's a carnival. And the carnival serves adults and it serves children. And you say, um, well, one day, 5,000 people came to the carnival. Well, if we're dividing everyone up as an adult or a child, that's the same as saying that the number of adults Thus, the number of children equals 5,000. And then maybe we have some additional piece of information. Maybe adults pay seven dollars to get in, children pay three dollars to get in, and the carnival makes
I have no idea what's realistic here. <laughs> 40,000. Then that's giving you a second equation. The number of the amount of money the carnival made from adults is seven times the number of adults. And the amount of money it makes from children is three times the number of children and the total amount it made. is $40,000. So this situation has given us two linear equations, both of which have to be true. Let me copy this over so that our A's and our C's are vertically above each other. So in this situation, when we have two linear equations or more, two or more linear equations that all have to be true, we say we have a system of linear equations and we put big curly brackets to the left to indicate that we're looking at these equations at once. Um, I erased and then rewrote um, that top equation. It's very important when you write the system down that you keep your variables alive. Like if you have something like three X one plus four X two minus X three equals seven. And then you have four X one minus two X three equals 12. This is no good. You see our x2 is above the x3. Instead, we leave some space and put the x3 over there. So, when I introduced systems of linear equations with that carnival example, what I said was they both must be true. That's going to give us the next definition. A solution to a system is a solution to every equation in the system. So it's not enough to satisfy just the first equation or just the second equation. You have to satisfy all of the equations in the system. So unlike when we're working with individual systems, it's a very easy individual equations, I meant to say. It's very easy to have a system that only has a single solution. I would 
say that having a single solution is kind of the default state. But it is sometimes possible to have multiple solutions. So we'll still sometimes want to talk about the solution set. Which again, is the set of all solutions. Um, and sort of our first, the first few things we do in this class, we'll be asking questions about solution sets. So, Questions we could ask about solution sets. Um, well, are there any solutions at all? Would I guess be sort of the first question? I mean, it's very easy to create a system that has no solutions. It's, it's kind of a boring example, but if x plus y equals zero, then x plus y certainly cannot be equal five. So there's a system with no solutions. If there are solutions, how many solutions are there? And finally, if there are solutions, what are they? And um, it's going to ultimately turn out that we answer all of these questions by performing basically the same process. We do something called Gauss-Jordan elimination, and the answer will tell us whether there are solutions, it will tell us how many solutions there are, and it will tell us what they are, all more or less at the same time. Um, let's briefly address this example in R2. By which I mean, let's look at examples like this, where we have two solutions and two equations, I mean to say, and two variables. Because this is going to give us the intuition, intuition that's going to hold, you know, even if we have like a billion variables and a billion equations. I mean, when we talked about a solution set on the plane, we said, well, it's the points on a straight line. So if we have two solutions, um, two solutions, that's two straight lines. 
uh, sorry, I, my, my mind is wandering. What I meant to say is that in something like this, each equation is giving us a straight line. X plus Y equals zero, that's a straight line. X plus Y equals five, that's a straight line. So what's it mean to be a solution to the system? Well, you have to be a solution to each individual equation. So you have to be on both the lines. And as it happens, these lines are parallel. There are no points on both the lines. So one answer to this question is that there might be zero solutions. Otherwise, we could have two straight lines that intersect and there will be one point that's on both the lines. In that case, there will be one solution or we can have a straight line that looks like that. And then we can have a second straight line that looks like that. And they're lying perfectly on top of one another. What am I? Undo. And in that case, there are an infinite number of points that are on both the lines. But we can see that, at least in this situation, where we've got two equations and two variables, these are our only possibilities. It's impossible to draw two straight lines and have them intersect three times, for example. It's either no solutions or one solution or infinitely many solutions. And uh, um, this intuition, which we get by messing around on the plane, as I say, perfectly and correctly extends to all situations. No matter how many equations, no matter how many variables, any system of equations can have none, one, or infinitely many solutions. Um, I said earlier that I thought having one solution is kind of the default state. I mean, if you imagine like probably pickup sticks are a thing of the past with digital games and stuff. But I mean, if you just take two sticks up and you throw them down, there is basically no chance that they're going to wind up perfectly parallel or one perfectly on top of the other. These are going to intersect around there. Um, that being said, there are some interesting applications where we have zero solutions or infinitely many solutions. That might seem surprising. It might seem like if there are no solutions, then the question can't have been very interesting. But um, just, and this is an example we'll talk about late in the class, so I won't dwell on it now, but you know the concept of linear regression, right? You have a bunch of points, you try to find a line that 
basically goes through the points. Well, if you have points, that fall perfectly on a line, you can find the equation of that line using linear algebra by solving a system of equations. Like say, We have these three points. We're looking for an equation of the form y equals mx plus b. Or maybe let me say mx plus b equals y. Well, we've got the point four comma four. So four M plus B equals four. And we've got the point three comma three. So three M plus B equals three. Likewise, two comma two and one comma one. So there's a system. It has one solution, and you solve it, and you find M, and you find B. Well, in most real world situations, they're not going to have points that fall perfectly on a line. Maybe you've got the point one comma one, and then you've got the point two, two point four seven. And we've got the point three, uh, 2.98. And we've got four, 4.17. Well, there's no longer a point that goes through. I mean, there's no longer a straight line that goes through all of these points. And now instead, but instead of asking for that line, which doesn't exist, you can do a linear regression. You can ask, say, well, what's the line that comes as close as possible as going through those points? Well, now we have a system of linear equations that has no solutions, but we're still going to use this system of linear equations to perform linear regression. We'll learn to ask the question, if there aren't any solutions, what's the closest to a solution that we do have? So even though there is no solution to this system, it has, very, it has applications. It can be used to do something very concrete. Um, there are also um, interesting applications where you have infinitely many solutions. Um, those are going to show up when you're dealing with proportions. Like you have, you know that um, the relationship between a city's spending on electricity and its city's spending on water 
So you have proportions, but you don't have absolute information. You're not told the city is spending this much on water. Um, maybe an example a lot of you have seen. I, I mean, I saw this in high school. I, I don't know Nebraska's curriculum. I, I, I was a Pennsylvania student. Um, balancing chemical equations, where you um, can look at a chemical equation and you get like, well, there are, are quite, um, twice as many oxygen atoms as there are carbon atoms. And the number of oxygen atoms plus the number of carbon atoms is three times the number of helium atoms. Um, it's been a long time since high school. Don't yell at me if I'm getting the details wrong. But again, you have these situations where you know, you have relationships between the number of atoms, but they're not you don't have this concrete information that there's one oxygen atom, for example. So when you're balancing chemical equations, you'll wind up with infinite solutions. And again, that comes down to linear algebra. So, Actually, no, I, I said it would be a light first day. It has been a light first day, but I think this is a pretty good time to call it. And Thursday will, um, I mean, my hope, it, it might be a little ambitious for one 75 minute class, mm. but my hope is that we'll, um, learn how to answer these questions, or if not, at least we'll make progress. Yeah. And let's see, how do I stop? I think I have to stop sharing before it will let me stop recording. <laughs>